Hey, everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about some major updates just at GN. Our fan testing machine is actually on the way now. We'll also be going over HP accidentally or maybe not leaking the NVIDIA RTX 3080 Super. Sometimes these leaks look like marketing, and this is one of those. Airflow is in, apparently, Thermaltake working on an Airflow version of some of its cases that we have complained about in the past. Asus and Noctua, speaking of Airflow, working on the video card design that was rumored previously. Now there are some photos of it that Asus accidentally leaked as well. So we'll be going over all of that and some more for this week. Before that, this video is brought to you by Kyoxia, said to be the original inventors of NAND flash memory and formerly known as Toshiba memory. Kyoxia's XG6 M.2 SSD is a high-end NVMe SSD claiming up to 3180 megabytes per second read and 2960 megabytes per second write speeds sequentially, and it's ideally used in high-performance gaming PCs or power-conscious laptops. The XG6 is available up to one terabyte, and the company also has its BG4 SSD in a much smaller M.2 2230 form factor for up to one terabyte of ultra compact storage. Learn more about Kyoxia at the links in the description below, including about their enterprise storage products. First up, just the GN updates. So many of you know that we're working on an office build out and move. We've posted two videos about it so far. Uh, there's been a lot of progress since those videos, and it's progressing quickly at this point. So. Uh, the last few weeks, we've had some major changes there. It's getting pretty close to usable. And the biggest item that we have for you as an update right now is that the fan testing machine we previously purchased for uh, it was somewhere like $45,000, $48,000 or something for a piece of fan testing, as in case fan testing equipment that is the very same that a lot of manufacturers use for designing and specking their fans. We bought one of those. That has now shipped or is being prepared to ship to us. So it's going to be a slow journey to get here. Uh, it's extremely large. It weighs 1,200 pounds, like 545 kilograms or something like that. And uh, it's, it's all paid for. It's on the way. And we're excited to start using it. Now, as we said previously, this is going to take time for us to figure out how to use. So sometimes we don't always share updates on the equipment we're getting in, we're working on, because it leads to a lot of people asking, hey, when are you going to start publishing stuff with it? And the reality is that it takes a very long time to become trained and competent with a tool like that. Uh, we have training lined up with the manufacturer of the test equipment. We're going to talk with some of the fan manufacturers as well, collect everyone's input. They're all biased, obviously, for their own product. So we like to talk to multiple sort of suppliers and figure out what each of them values. And then we collect all of that, start doing some of our own testing. And then after we've done our own testing, we take that data, we take manufacturer sample data, and we start forming opinions on what actually matters versus what's kind of just marketing that's designed to promote one brand over the other. So previously, we said our target was to get it in by November. We're actually a little bit ahead of schedule on that, which is awesome. And uh, we also said that we were looking to do actual reviews probably in first quarter of 2022. I'm hoping for January, February timeline. We'll see how heavy CES hits us. But uh, that's the plan. We'll likely publish a few things about it in the interim where we're going to show OK, we're figuring out how to use this. Here's a feature test of a one-off. Uh, and that'll be about the most you get up until we're ready for reviews. So anyway, that's really exciting. The total investment on the fan stuff before getting into the training and the time it'll take to refine the methodology. Uh, we spent six months refining our cooler methodology previously. Before all that's factored in, the machine is approaching 50 grand. The shipping, obviously, and the insurance is expensive. It's like 10 or so plus, uh, and it's expensive. But as we said previously, I bought it because I want to use it. I think it's fun. Uh, ultimately, sometimes you do things that aren't the best strict financial decision as a company, but you, something that's exciting, that keeps you interested, that keeps you and or the team uh, going and, and motivated to learn something new. In this case, learning about fans, bearings, pressure and flow. All this stuff is going to be pretty new to us. We're aware of it. We've done research, obviously, but not to this extent. So this is a purchase that's really just, I want it because it'd be cool. And it's not something that we feel is served very heavily right now. So it, it, it should be fun to learn and work with. And we know a lot of you are interested as well in sort of an, an end all is X fan good or not? And we'll be able to provide that finally. So that's it for the update on that one. If you want to help us soak some of the cost for that, uh, because as we said before, we're, it'll take years to actually make that money back on just fan content. So 
Patreon and the store are the way we are basically soaking these equipment purchases and the reason they're possible. Views, if you can't afford to buy anything, that's fine. You can't afford or don't want to contribute to Patreon, that's totally fine. We get it. Uh, watching stuff, sharing it, obviously, is a massive help as well. But for those of you who want to support directly and get something quality in return, you can grab one of our mod mats. They're in stock and shipping now. They're back, so we just got a big shipment in. Uh, however, after the previous video announcing it, we're already sold through more than half of it. So if you want to grab one, go to store.gamersaccess.net. They're PC building work services to protect your table and the parts you're building with. They're anti-static. The volts have two snaps. We have a ton of the mediums in stock because we didn't do back orders for those. So you've got a great chance to get a medium if you want a smaller one. And they all have different diagrams, pinouts. Uh, the Volt, for example, we added Ethernet wiring diagrams on it when we launched that one. So that's pretty useful for people who do networking. And it's also a high quality heat resistant material that's great for tube bending or soldering projects, things of that nature. So grab one on the store or you can go to Patreon where we published two behind the scenes videos with the double Patrick's last week. And I'm working on a behind the scenes video of my own to go up on Patreon. So thank you to everyone for helping us pay for these equipment purchases so that we can provide unique, fun, interesting, and educational content that hopefully gets to the bottom of what products are actually worth it, what's marketing, and do something that's just like the core of what we do here, different and focused on consumer and focused on really looking into these products and understanding them beyond a surface level, open the box, hook the fan up and say, oh, those temperatures seem good. We're looking forward to it. Uh, if you want to provide input on what you think would be interesting for us to explore next, we are starting to look. I don't have that much money to throw around again right now. But uh, things we're considering are, um, without getting too much into detail, we're looking at thermal conductivity machines. We're looking at uh, salt spray testers. That would be for water cooling components, survivability in different environments. We are looking at uh, thermal chambers. That's probably going to be the next purchase, but um, we'll see. Let us know what you think would be interesting at a component level. If you don't know the machines, just let us know what you think would be cool for us to get more into on a PC component level, and we'll find the machines for that. So, all right, let's get started with the news. HP deftly leaks the RTX 3080 Super. Yes, this is something that HP has gotten very good at recently, which is uh, exposing its partner's plans for just about everything. HP's recent NV34 all-in-one has received a free marketing push at NVIDIA's expense, unless it's all part of the plan. The NV34 creator-focused AIO PC listed an RTX 3080 Super in its specs table. That's the leak. Yes, just the fact that it, this exists. The Super refresh is most likely to launch sometime between December and February, and the 3080 Super is likely launching alongside or shortly before other Super Series refreshes of the 30 line. These will be incremental improvements on existing products, in theory, and will likely decluster the cluster flux of uh, memory configurations that are currently available on RTX 30 Series cards available from NVIDIA. Still looking for a low-end card. AMD has been in rumors recently for having its low-end cards coming out, but not much on the NVIDIA side. Thermal Take just announced an upcoming ATX tower in its divider series, which previously did not divide our opinion because it was completely suffocated and closed off. But now Thermal Take is adding some ventilation and airflow to jump onto the trend, but a trend which is functional and beneficial to everyone because letting a computer breathe makes it good. If you remember our Thermal Take marketing grievances video from previously, you may remember the divider or at least the groans we emitted upon seeing yet another completely closed off case and a bunch of thermal images of it that are entirely pointless and often have mismatched scales. Thermal Take has, however, learned that the thermal images should... <laughs> th thermal, thermal Take is learning about thermography. It's everyone has to start somewhere. Uh, thermal images previously used had a scale of random to who cares, and now they're at least using a scale of something like 23 to 25 to 70C between their comparison before and after images. So that's a start. Uh, as a reminder, thermography of the side of a computer is actually pointless and doesn't tell you anything about the case, which is what they're trying to market. So we're not really sure what the, it makes a pretty picture, but we're not sure what it's trying to do beyond that. Thermal Take, to its credit though, has heard the interest for more airflow. And so it updated the divider line with the divider 500 TG Air. Aside from the marketing about the uh, Avant's grade, panels all over the page, the focus mostly directs attention toward the T logo stamped on the front panel. This is a big improvement over solid glass or steel, although the porosity looks relatively low compared to the surface area. Thermal Take divides the divider panel in half in a genuinely unique way. We haven't seen this many other places other than a couple early attempts from CyberPower and pre-built 
mock-ups and prototypes. The left panel looks like it has optional full glass or ventilated glass plus steel, although we'll have to test how much that vent matters since it's at kind of a weird angle to the video card. The right side has optional glass or ventilation as well, which if using ventilation would align partially with the radiator, although it looks like it cuts off the bottom corner of it. Genuinely, it's good to see that Thermaltake is at least trying. It, it, Thermaltake has been one of the companies along with NZXT that's been the most resistant to changing its products from sort of uh, about a decade ago, where it's been incremental improvements. Thermaltake, oddly, some of its best cases it's made in the last few years have been the ones that has marketed and advertised the least. They're the ones that it literally puts in a back corner behind a black curtain in the CES or Computex showrooms, and we have to go, what's behind that curtain? And they go, you're not going to be interested in that. Pull the curtain aside. And it's like, wow. So that's where all the good cases are. Why, why is there this huge disconnect between what we're interested in? Uh, but they've been working on it. It's good to see the TG Air is, in fact, adding airflow to a unique idea, which is the divided case. We've requested one at this point. We expect it in soon, and we'll do a review of it once we get it. In its quest to continue launching products that blow up, Gigabyte recently posted on its German Twitter page these photos of an inflatable chair. We're actually not sure if this is real or not. Uh, if it were April 1st, we would genuinely think that this is a joke. But this we're not clear on. Hopefully, they're just trolling us. The chair is inflatable if it exists, and uh, that's indicated by the two air valves and by the self-reply tweet where Gigabyte uses the hashtags hashtag gaming life and hashtag inflatable. However, we wouldn't recommend looking through the hashtag inflatable hashtag while at work. Although we are known critics of gaming chairs, this might actually be the worst that we've ever seen in the gaming chair category, but it is creative. We look forward to buying Gigabyte's inflatable gaming chair to see if it blows up uh, until the point at which we are confident that it's real though, because that's always a great place for your product to be where People aren't sure if your genuine announcement is serious or not. Uh, until that point, we don't know if we get anyone. But if you see a pop-up for sale, let us know and we'll buy it. Up next, manufacturing industry shutdowns that can affect, actually already are affecting supply of some components. Uh, aluminum capacitors, aluminum-based small service mount devices were affected recently by this. So manufacturing has been hit by a wave of mandated shutdowns in China. Part of this is to try and stave off rising coal and uh, energy resource pricing, natural gas, for example. Uh, part of it is attempting to hit emission goals, apparently, and part of it is, uh, well, the, the high power utilization right now causing what we would assume would be maybe brownouts in certain regions. The power crunch will likely have a ripple effect that will acutely affect the already sensitive global supply chain. As many companies across the globe right now rely on China's manufacturing hubs, particularly electronics manufacturers, this is going to start showing up rather quickly. Companies like NVIDIA, Apple, Tesla, NXP, Qualcomm, and basically everyone else all have key suppliers in China, some of which have already reported halts in production due to the temporary power shutdowns. In fact, even outside of electronics, we have run into some limitations with some of our factories where since they can only work certain days or use a certain amount of power, there's a limit to what they can produce. This goes beyond the actual completed component like a MOSFET, for example, and it affects people like metal suppliers, metal workers, uh, refineries, and factories of that nature as well, where you're getting into raw materials that need to go to the factories. So you have shutdowns affecting both of those. It causes delays. In one example, Eson Precision Engineering, which is an assembler and supplier for Apple and Tesla, said that it had stopped production at its facilities in Qinshan, China. Quote, the company will leverage its inventory to maintain the operation while production is halted. We expect to arrange production on the weekends or in the upcoming holidays next month to meet customers' needs, Isan stated in a filing with the Taiwan Stock Exchange. Similarly, Unimicron Technology stated that its subsidiaries in the cities of Suzhou and Qinshan in Jiangsu province have also halted production. Unimicron Technology is a huge PCB manufacturer serving multiple markets, including the PC market and again is a key supplier for companies like Apple. Other key suppliers in the area that were affected are Concraft Holding and Pegatron, which is a big company in the PC space. Changhua Technology has also been forced to stop production through at least the end of the month. Changhua Technology is a packaging company and its key clients 
our NXP semiconductor, and Infineon. You may know Infineon from the VRM component supply, where Infineon makes things like MOSFETs, for example, controllers, things of that nature. Uh, additionally, according to the report from Nikkei Asia Review, several key suppliers for Intel, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, unsurprisingly, are affected by this and were forced to at least temporarily suspend production or take uh, an altered schedule for production. Of course, all this is happening as we head into the last quarter of the year, which is the peak buying season. So industries, including electronics and automotive in particular, have suffered unprecedented disruptions in supply chain over the past year and will continue to for the next few months. And that's not even to talk of logistics, like shipping containers being stuck in lines out in the ocean outside of LA in particular, one of the major ports in the US and in North America in general, uh, where it's taking them longer than usual to get through. Some of the port costs have gone up uh, and container costs and availability have gotten rough as well. So all this compounds into maybe not the best news for any kind of component. But this isn't just PC. This is like everything that you can buy. I had trouble buying a dishwasher for the new office for probably, we looked on and off for weeks. So this, this is uh, a wider issue than GPUs out of stock meme, but you know, hopefully, hopefully things improve as logistics improve. Uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll get back to happier news in a moment, but might as well do one more sort of sad story before we move back to brighter pastures. Uh, Silicon Lottery is closing its doors. You may be aware of the phrase Silicon Lottery, but if you've been around in the industry for a while or you've built computers for a while, you probably also know the website, siliconlottery.com. Silicon Lottery provided the several services, including delating CPUs, like when Intel was using TIM thermal paste for its CPUs, they would provide a service to delid them and sell it to you, potentially related with liquid metal. Uh, Silicon Lottery also provided most famously its binning service, where it would sort through CPUs that were retail, find the best ones, provide a very detailed report on everything that uh, they did for the CPU testing and otherwise stability testing, and then tell you sort of what frequency and voltage you could expect to use. And in addition to its overclocking testing and work and research, it published a lot of research on the numbers of expected voltages, expected frequencies, and provided a good service for what the CPUs can do. Unfortunately, Silicon Lottery is going to be closing down. It's looking to close before November, probably October 31st is what they're saying. And this is after seven years in business. We've actually spoken with the owner of Silicon Lottery in the past, and uh, they were providing a great service at the site. It's uh, at this point though, they say no longer viable to keep the doors open. And this is actually something I think years ago we briefly discussed in passing about how AMD or Intel, for example, were both binning to the extent that it gets difficult to carve that niche back out. Silicon Lottery cited reasons such as overclocking headroom dwindling. It talked about the amount of headroom left for manual overclocking declining. It spoke of Intel and AMD opting to leave little performance on the table and instead looking to basically monetize every ounce of frequency that can be squeezed out of the silicon by having more product segmentation. Silicon Lottery points out accurately that this has come in the form of higher stock frequencies out of the box aggressive boosting algorithms, and tighter bins between SKUs. On the point of tighter bins, this is something Intel has been doing for a while now, offering highly binned variants in an attempt to segment its product stack. The i9-9900KS was essentially a heavily binned 9900K, as an example. Silicon Lottery highlights the continued trend with Intel's Rocket Lake, stating, quote, the 11900K is essentially a binned 11700K, so with the 11900K, we're binning what has already been fairly heavily binned. This type of product segmentation is nothing new, but having such minor differences between two models is a more recent shift. And of course, these companies moving mostly to soldering has eliminated a lot of the delitting service. Silicon Lottery also said, quote, in addition, supply issues have taken a major toll on us even before the pandemic started. They said our orders with distributors for the last few releases have been nightmares of delays upon delays. Silicon Lottery said that if the market heavily changes, it is open to the idea of reopening its doors to continue providing this service. It stated, quote, while we will be closed for the foreseeable future, it's not necessarily goodbye forever. If things change in the market, in particular, if overclocking headroom and variation increases for whatever reason, it's possible we'll get things rolling again. Silicon Lottery said that orders placed for its d service specifically will need to be done by November 30th in order to be completed. It also noted that warranty service beyond October 31st uh, will need to be 
requested via the email that is included on packaging slips for customers. Whether or not you ever used Silicon Lottery or even thought it was a useful service, we thought the data was definitely very interesting. Some of the best collected data for that specific segment, overclocking, frequency, voltage, performance on CPUs, that was available. And uh, as a small business, that was in, an enthusiast niche in the community. So obviously, that's that's, that's a, it's a pretty important role to fill, and it's sad to see them go. AMD, targeting 30 times CPU efficiency boosting by 2025, asterisk, depends on the formula you use. AMD announced a lofty goal for its epic CPUs and instinct GPU accelerators. It wants to increase the efficiency specifically as it relates to AI training and HPC applications. AMD claims the expected improvement is 2.5x in the same time, but it's targeting 30x. AMD also points out that its 30x goal would save billions of kilowatt hours of electricity by 2025 and reduce the required power for accelerated compute nodes to complete a single calculation by 97% over five years. AMD set similarly lofty goals back in 2014, known as its 25 by 20 energy efficiency initiative. That initiative put AMD on a course to improve the efficiency of its mobile chips by as much as 25 times by 2020. AMD succeeded this thanks to Zen and Ryzen, and now it's stating via media that its baseline for measurement for the new goal is based on the aggregate performance of an existing 2020 system using four MI50 GPUs and one Epic Rome 7742 CPU. AMD is specifically focusing on FP16 or BF16 flops performance. Tom's Hardware also received additional comments from AMD on how it aims to hit the 30X mark, and the company via Tom's said, quote, we used internal AMD lab measurements of MI50 paired with an Epic 7742 CPU, which produced 5.26 teraflops per MI50 on 4K matrix DGEMM with trigonometric data initialization and 21.6 teraflops of FP16 on 4K matrices. AMD continued and laid out a formula for its performance, and we'll put that on the screen. Up next, Game Ball. It's a good name. It's a great start. There's a lot of room there for meme advertising and marketing material. Uh, Game Ball may be taking a page from Corsair's many years old to now mechanical mouse advertisement. Uh, has been in development for five years at this point. It is finally available for purchase, and it's a $150 trackball that's targeted at gaming. The Game Ball trackball mouse is a product of Blue Sun Innovations and is being manufactured in the United Kingdom by a company with years of experience with trackball mice specifically. The Game Ball is a, a bit of an oddity as it attempts to match both the world of trackball and gaming mice. Trackball mice remain popular in some segments and even a necessity for those who can't use a standard gaming mouse, for example, due to the fatigue and strain that a conventional mouse puts on the wrist. That said, trackball mice aren't usually an apt choice for gaming due to the accuracy issues, and there aren't too many options for trackball mice that also have high performance in mind. That said, it's the absence in the market that BSI is attempting to address with its Game Ball mouse. The Game Ball, of course, has the trackball, but is also ambidextrous. Additionally, it also features a custom PixArt optical sensor with native CPI or DPI resolutions of 400, 800, 1200, 2000, and 3000 alongside ceramic bearings. For the rest, standard Omron switches and a 1000 Hz pulling rate are also on the mouse. If you're curious about how it actually looks playing a game, Game Ball founder Eric Anders has published some videos on YouTube showing it, uh, for example, in Assassin's Creed Valhalla and Valorant. The Game Ball is 148 or so dollars, and it includes a one-year warranty. Don't think we'll try it out. We don't do much with peripherals, but uh, certainly we'd, we'd be interested in hearing from you all. If any of you have it already, post a comment below, or if you get it, let us know via Twitter or something what you think of it in the future. Amazon's New World MMO has launched. Uh, it's new. We, it's, we've been told it's new. It doesn't really look it, but uh, the game wasted little time in reverting back to its old self, its GPU-killing ways and it promptly claimed the life of at least a few video cards with the launch. So pour one out of your GN Cobalt Blue with gold trim beer glass for the unsuspecting GeForce RTX cards. We don't have an exact number of bricked cards to report, but the reports seem to mostly be focused on, again, the RTX 3090, 3080 Ti, and the 3080 cards. We haven't personally seen reports of AMD cards, but if you've had one fail, let us know in the comments. The BRICS cards span not only a number of models, but also vendors, and aren't limited to EVGA this time. Back in July, when New World was available in beta, it was killing cards, Gigabyte and EVGA mostly, uh, and EVGA 
did some failure analysis, ultimately found it was a couple dozen cards, I think it was 24 or something like that, and that it was related to a solder joint in the MOSFETs, or the soldering quality of the MOSFETs, where there was cracking. When the Future reported that the publication's Gigabyte RTX 3090 had failed while testing the game, and users on Reddit are reporting that the game has breaks their 3080 Ti or 3080 cards as well. The only real takeaway here is if you're in possession of a 30 series card, maybe be wary of New World right now. Uh, we've seen people talking about undervolting or reducing the power target for their cards to support the game. We haven't tried this. Maybe that's something you could do if you're really desperate to play it, or you could just avoid it till it's addressed. As of this writing, Amazon Games has not publicly commented on the matter. Uh, however, cell signal in space is spotty at best, so maybe Jeff is busy right now. But that's it for this one. Thanks for watching, as always. So that's right, we're on first, we're on first name terms. Jeff and I, we're, between the two of us, we have billions of dollars. And by that, I mean Jeff Bezos has billions of dollars. Uh, and I'm including myself. I, please give me money, Jeff. I need it. Uh, anyway, we need to buy more machines. The fan machine was expensive. Please, Jeff. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to check out some of the behind the scenes videos uh, and store.gamersnexus.net for mod mats and other items. We'll see you all next time.